This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm David McDonald. I'm Sam Mercier's. And this week we're joined by composer and contemporary music advocate Armandro Bajolo. He's the founder and artistic director of the Great Noise Ensemble, curator of the New Music at Atlas series, and writes for publications such as New Music Box and Sequenza 21. He's the curator of the upcoming Andreessen 75 Festival in the Washington, D.C. area, which is a week-long festival celebrating the life and work and 75th birthday of Louis Andreessen. We'll certainly be eager to hear about that, as well as Great Noise Ensemble's new album. Uh, we'll be talking about that, too, later on. Armando, thanks for joining us today. Hi, thanks for being here. So, sorry, I, um, sorry I stepped on your line there. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We do that all the time at the show. Overexcited. Well, and, and you missed the, the, all the wonderful things that he was about to say about you, too. Right? That's the important thing. All right? lies. All lies spread by my competitors. <laughs> I'm, I'm a real charmer. I can, I can make it happen. Um, but, uh, yeah, like I said, thanks for joining us today. Um, I think you seem to be a very, very busy guy these days, um, especially with this new album coming out and the festival that you're preparing for, um, which starts April 7th. Am I correct? April 6th. 6th. So what yeah. has been the uh, the preparation like for for Andreessen, who who is coming to town for this, for the whole festival, I believe, right? Yes, he's arriving April 2nd, and we'll be here for rehearsals on La Comedia April 3rd, 4th, and 5th, and then we'll be here for the entire festival. Um, the preparations, it's been about two years of work. From initial conception, it was just going to be one concert, and then... I started, since I was you know, curator at Atlas at that point, I started thinking hey, maybe we can put together a couple of other concerts, do about a three-show deal. And then the idea came up of inviting other venues in town. So it's been sort of that process of inviting people over, I guess, 18 months. It hasn't been quite two years of, of process. Um, and putting something together for Louis, who is our was one of Great Noise Ensemble's artistic advisors and has become a friend since we did Demetiri back in 2010 with him in attendance. Um, so it's been, it's been a blast and it's, been, it's, it's going to be really exciting. It's the absolutely biggest thing I've ever put together. So it's mm -hmm. a little overwhelming, um, but it's going to be really fun. It's going to be great. Well, uh, I think certainly the press has taken notice too because it seems to be the event of the season for at least for the D.C. area especially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's gotten you know some serious highlights in in, uh, in the post, and I know um, I know everyone. There's some people uh, I, th or I think are planning on coming down from New York, um, you know, me included, <laughs> of course. Um, but uh, you know, something this serious for 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 Louis' birthday is is uh, is a great thing that you guys are doing, and it's um, in a collaboration with a number of other partners, correct? Yes. Yeah, so we have. The partners are all, you know, the Atlas is, Atlas and Great Noise are sort of the anchors for this. Atlas is presenting three, three concerts, and Great Noise is presenting two. We're presenting La Comedia, and then our two pianists are performing the American premiere of Louis' collection, Image de Moreau, which is a, a gorgeous book that he published last year, um, collecting something like eight, uh, 12 pieces, I think, mm -hmm. from the last 40 years of his career, something like that. Um, and then we're, we are partnering with the um, with a local jazz ensemble. My um, So for Atlas also, it's not just, it's, it's partnering also with other venues like the Mansion at Strathmore and the National Gallery of Art and Shenandoah University. But also within Atlas, the two concert series, the jazz series and the new music series, are partnering up for one event, which is you know the the this piano recitals also um, combined with a showcase of Louis scores for jazz ensemble. So Brad, the Brad Lindy ensemble, is going to be performing those, and Brad is my jazz counterpart at Atlas. Um, so there's a little bit of internal collaboration as well as external collaboration. Um, so as far as the performers, you know, aforementioned Great Noise, of course, and Brad Lindy Ensemble, but also we have Christina Zavalloni coming from Italy. She's um, performing in La Comedia. 
and performing um, a recital with Monica Gemino and Andrea Ribaudengo, her pianist partner. Um, Monica Gemino is performing a recital with Frank Vanderwey, her engineer partner, and then performing Louis' most recent, um, well, uh, one of his most recent major works, um, La Giro, which is this right. concerto that he wrote for her, for kind of a performing singing violinist. Um, we have Bang in a Can. The Bang in a Can all starts are wrapping up the Washington portion of the festival before we move to Winchester for Edge Ensemble, which is the uh, resident contemporary ensemble at Shenandoah, and the A Aeolus Quartet performing all of Louis String Quartets at the end of the festival. Um, we're, also, we're, we're partnering with Lucy and Hawks for promotion, and we're, we've partnered with the Los Angeles Philharmonic as well. The LA Philharmonic is... Um, helping with some travel costs, so I want to give them a shout out on that, um, because then Louis is going over to LA the following week for their Minimalist Jukebox Festival. So, right. it's well, been, so it's, that's grown quite a bit, I would say, from one concert that you thought you right. might have. So it got a little bit, it got a little bit bloated, it got a little big, um, in a, in a good, good way. way. Yeah. It, but, um, okay, bloated is the wrong way. It got, got, got out of hand in a good way. It got muscular, it got strong, it got, you know, <laughs> yeah. So it's going to be great. It's going to be a really fun festival. Um, we also have um, the one event, the one night off. We have one night off on Thursday. And we have a, a special event, a special by invitation only reception at the Dutch Embassy on Thursday afternoon. Wow. Mm -hmm. That'll be nice. So the Dutch uh, Embassy and Consulate have been really, really helpful as well. And we're throwing a little party there on Thursday afternoon, the, the April, what is that, the 10th? Um, um, I believe so. I believe and, it's the 10th. Yeah, so it should, be, it should be really fun. I can't believe it's like less than a month away. <laughs> One of the perks of being in D.C., having access to consulates. Right. <sighs> Very nice. Well, the, the Dutch consulate's actually in New York. So, uh -oh. um, yeah. So, and, oh, and still, for cultural close. stuff, you have to deal with the consulate, not the embassy. But, so, Yeah. It's um, so cool so, that 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 there's this big celebration for for these composers that are still alive. We've seen several of these in the last few years, and I it's it's in stark contrast to all of these centennials and bicentennials and sesquicentennials and and things for for dead composers. It's wonderful that we can honor these people while they're still with us and still writing. Um, right. You know, Commedia is not even that old, right? How old is that, that opera? Just... Right, the, the world premiere of La Commedia was in 2008. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's, it's... In fact, I heard it for the first time when I went to meet with Louis when we were preparing Dematiri with Great Noise Ensemble. Hmm. And so I went to New York in 2010, and he invited me to come along to hear La Commedia in Carnegie Hall. So that's, yeah, and that was the... That was one of the two American premieres. And that is when you decided to mount this enormous project, right? No, that was more, that was after Materi, and it was, you know, it was kind of an excuse to, you know, Louis, Louis' music is kind of an obsession of mine since I was a grad student. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, with Materi, I got to, it's one of those cool things where I got to be, become friends with my hero. Um, so, you know, looking into Materi, then he agreed to be, he really loved Great Noise, so he agreed to be one of our artistic advisors. And because of that, we thought, well, his 75th is coming up. We should do something for that. Yeah. Um, so that was, that's really when the decision was made. It's like, oh, we, we should do something really important for him. Um, because nobody else was doing it, and we were really surprised about that. So, of course, now other things, you know, there's a lot of other things going on in Europe. But in the U.S., I think this is where the really the only major thing happening for her 75th birthday. I mean, it's quite a major thing. But, right. Um, yeah. do, you think, do you think Louis is seen differently? Do you think there's a, a great difference between his, his image over here and, and what it is in Europe? Well, that's a good question. I think so. I've been told that from the Dutch, which is interesting. They always comment when I talk to them about Louis and I say, oh, now we want to do this. They always say, even at the consulate and in the embassy, they say, it's so funny, you Americans love him so much. He's not nearly as big as he is here in Holland. Um, which is funny, because I think of him as being really big in Holland. Um, but I think his impact, because of the fact that he, that American music has been so major for him, 
I think that has made him so attractive to American composers, especially for me. And I know that this is not unique in my experience. He was his music kind of was a nice. What it does is it presents a nice bridge between European modernism and minimalism and post minimalism, and an answer to wanting to write music that's in a sort of tonal language, but also allows for crunchy expressive dissonances, mm -hmm. which a lot of minimalism from the, the Steve Reichfeld glass vein doesn't really allow for. It doesn't, they didn't really use as much. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and I know that that's true for, for some of the, you know, the Bang and a Can guys and a lot of other composers for whom Louis has been important. So it's been, I think that sort of um, maverick aspect of his as well. Um, because in Europe, that was you know, the fact that he was into jazz. Well, jazz not so much, but that he was into minimalism and taking American composers more seriously was seen as something of a maverick strain. <laughs> and, you know, that maverick strain is a very American thing. So I think there's, a, there's that connection um, that makes it so much more stronger for American culture, American composers, than maybe it is in Holland. Although he's a very Dutch composer. Yeah. I mean, his, his music... You look at La Comedia, um, the first movement of it is called The City of Dis, and there's the, all these ele all this electronic soundscape that accompanies the, the live score that includes city noises. I mean, the City of Dis is the city in the middle of, of hell in Dante's Inferno, but he's taking texts from a... I'm trying to remember what it's called, but this society, the sort of carnival society, in Holland, that's this, you know, that's fun and very irreverent, and the he labels the city sounds at the beginning of the piece at the in the middle of the piece. It's the city sounds represent the city of this. At the beginning of the piece, they represent represent da the Damrock, which is the the biggest canal and that goes to the center of Amsterdam. So it's representing both Holland, representing Amsterdam itself, and representing the city in hell. And it, you know, also when you look when you think about this. Um, there's been a lot of comparisons to the layout of hell in Dante, which is circular, and the layout of Amsterdam, which is sort of concentric circles as well coming out of the ocean. Um, so he points that out in, in his book, The, the Art of Stealing Time. Um, so I think it's an interesting connection. And it, so the idea of him being so important to Americans when he's very culturally Dutch, um, it's a bit of a contradiction perhaps. Yeah. But it's, yeah. it's very interesting. I, I like that you said that your description that he's 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 like these minimalists and it, it draws these you know minimalist influences from the United States and is still that almost brash European modernism and I think maybe some of that brashness is also something that American composers find sure. appealing, um, yeah. especially people that listen to minimalist music and find the the process oriented nature of it to be very interesting but then the surface that is used to express that is i f i think a lot of times not very compelling on its own and and reason's form of it is really hard to ignore it's really in your face the whole time it's very uh uh de it demands your attention in a way that i think a lot of american minimalism doesn't um, yeah, i mean american minimalism the, of the kind you're talking about actively works against that i think it's encouraging you to not be sort of like right in the moment on the music to more, to think of it more as like a stasis kind of feel you know oh. I'm going to have to disagree with that, actually, guys. Mm. Um, this is, I'm going to put my professor hat on now. Uh-oh. Because I, I, I taught a class at Peabody on minimalism. And actually, and, and that, sort of, that was my impression of minimalism when I first encountered it, too. That it was, oh, it's trance music. You're not supposed to pay attention. <laughs> when you, you read Steve Reich, especially, Steve Reich wants the process to be... And, you know, this is Steve Reich in the 60s and 70s. Steve Reich now has a diff much different aesthetic, I think. But, yeah. Um, but Steve Reich in the 60s and 70s, process needs to be obvious so that you can follow it, you can pay attention to it. Um, what did he say? He's like, I'm not holding any cards that you, that you can't see. So he wasn't interested in the, the kind of crazy tricks of, of right. academic composers that he grew up with. He was, you know, like the audience should know this and it, you should be able to follow it. 
And so you should be able to pay attention. Phil Glass as well. You listen to his early scores, and they're very severe. You have to really follow the process as part of the process of listening. To, to be clear, I wouldn't say that, that, um, that you're intended to kind of ignore or, or listen passively to that music. I just think it's very easy to do, and it's sure. much harder okay. to do that with Andreessen. Well, Andreessen yeah. is also so loud. Right, <laughs> right. That's true. Right, and and when I say I didn't I didn't say that that it demand doesn't demand that you listen to it. I just think you listen differently when you when you have this smooth voice leading that goes and goes and goes. You stop you stop expecting to hear anything surprising in the way the note to note movements happen, and I think that frees you to listen to the process. Sure, and Dreesen, and Dreesen doesn't let you forget about the notes in that way. Sure. I guess is what I'm getting at. Yeah, anyway. I guess that's okay, an extra enough. layer. There's yeah. also, you know, for Andreessen, there's also a, um, what am I calling, um, a, a sort of polemical side to his music where, yeah. you know, Steve Reich, music for 18 musicians is just music for 18 musicians. There's no no polemics, no... no it's abstract. Yeah, whereas, you know, Destat was a, is a piece about <laughs> politics and the effects, you know, and and the effects of music on politics, or lack thereof. Um, so there's a you know, very, very different approach to it. So the polemics of it um, are much more to the forefront, where, whereas Steve Reich didn't really get... Polemic isn't really the right word. I mean, he only the only piece I can think of... I would say different trains pretty much is the opposite of that, though. I mean, right. Different trains and Daniel variations. You know, WTC 911. WTC 911, of course. And those are pieces, you know, from the last 25 years. So it's, it's, you know, later, middle and later Reich. So, yeah. And I would, I would, I would also say those are clearly the exceptions, even, even in that sure. period. Right. right. Exactly. Um, but yeah, it's, it's great that, that it could be, and, and the reason, not just that the music is related musically between Andreessen's music and those guys, but also we just celebrated birthdays of theirs as well, you right. know. So it's 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 cool that they're that that they're all kind of colliding in that way. Right. Um, yeah. Reich eighty will be coming up pretty soon. Actually, do we so. really need to do every five? <laughs> I mean, he just got seventy five. Well, I just feel like we got we just did seventy for him, I and mean, that I, Steve Reich's seventieth birthday. That was one of the things that put Great Noise on the map because it was our the beginning of our second season, and we were the only ones to do a Steve Reich birthday concert in DC. Oh. So and that was almost ten years ago, and that just blows my mind. <laughs> Pro tip: If you want to grow up and have an awesome new music series and maybe an awesome new music ensemble, look for birthdays. Yeah, Just, well, you know, yeah, that's part and of it's to, and I mean, it's to be founded on uh, Craigslist. Craigslist, that's right. right. <laughs> that was the that was the inception of Great Noise, right? That was indeed. <laughs> mm-hmm. Craigslist. Of course, I'm never going to retire, so. You know, there is that to consider. Right. <laughs> right. So you're <laughs> always going to have to compete. Right. And you're not going to get rich off of this. So. Well, we'll have by Jolo 75 when your time comes. So. Well, okay. About that. <laughs> Let's see if I'm still around. <laughs> one way or another. You keep doing these. I don't know. Yes. I don't know. Let's see. Well, I wasn't sure what was on the festival, and and I was reviewing all the content this morning, and I kept reading and reading and reading, and I'm like, holy cow, this is uh, gonna put poor old Rondo in the in the in the ground. So, kudos. That is a a lot of stuff to organize. Um, yeah, it's 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 intense. Um, I've had a lot of really good help. The the venues and the the partners have been fantastic, and I've delegated a lot of the work. So we you know, right. I, Go you know, ahead. I, to, I, I should shout out to um, Georgina DeVore at the Strathmore who took on, <clears throat> took on visas especially. Because um, if I had to do the visas that would have been, I would still be mm-hmm. I would still be working on them. Um, and, and Sam Sweet my executive director at, at Atlas has been really, really great as well. Um, and, you know, so every, you know, it's, that's, the, and that's sort of been my philosophy throughout my, my career is just finding good, excellent collaborators mm-hmm. who share your vision and can, you know, share their expertise. So what, I, I'm curious about mounting La Comedia because that is a huge project. Yeah. 
And uh, I, 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 I don't know how many times it's been performed, but it can't be that many. Um, what's it been like putting together a project that's that complicated on that scale that is e even as just one piece of this larger festival? Well, that one, interestingly enough, doesn't feel as complex to me anymore. Really? Because, because we did Demetiri in 2010, and that is a much bigger piece than, than La Comedia in terms of the sheer size and number of people involved and the difficulty of the music. Um, now, ask me again in two weeks when we start having rehearsals about the difficulty of the music. Um, Commedia is not easy. Um, so, um, we, you know, we got to approach it very, very carefully. But um, I feel like Materi was this big baptism by fire. So now, you know, I remember when we were pitching the project originally to the National Gallery and Stephen Acker, the director there, I was like, oh, this piece has a chimbalum. Where am I going to find a chimbalum player? And he tells me, Armando, you put together La Demetiri, which involves like 75 people. And you're worried about a chimbalum? You'll find a chimbalum. Um, <laughs> and we did. We found this great guy, Nick Tolley, out in Boston. He's coming for the whole festival. Wow. Um, and so, you know, that one, that one doesn't seem... It hasn't been as complicated to put together. We had some some issues with because it's a much more recent piece. The the parts are still kind of were still being edited in many ways. So we had to have parts sent back, and it was it, you know that added to some complications. And then of course we have to blow up great noise. It's one of these projects we do occasionally where we blow up to you know beyond our twenty member core into like sixty members. In this case, there's forty five instrumentalists. Um, so we're wow. doubling in size and then some. I I I'm looking I'm looking through the uh, boozy performances right now. I think I think this will be the ninth performance right. of La Comedia. So there was a run at the world premiere in 2008 by the Netherlands Opera. Right. Uh, and then it came to uh, came to the U.S. for uh, at Walt Disney Concert Hall, mm. and then at Carnegie, and now we're here in Washington D.C. This is really the third American performance. Um, yes, it is. Wow. So, congratulations. There you go. Uh, though, sorry, I should, I should specify that the Carnegie performance was the premiere of the concert version in the right. United and States. That's, and we're doing the concert version. I thought L.A. was a concert version as well. Um, it could be, uh, oh, uh, yes, it was. That was. Concert version in L.A., concert version in New York. Yeah, I don't think another production has been mounted yet, although I thought, I thought there was one upcoming. There might be. I know there's a Materi in Belgium this summer. I'll have to ask around. I don't think has been staged since the premiere. That's a really weird, difficult piece to stage. But. So with the difficulties in the parts and everything, I imagine you've been working much more closely with Louis than you would for some of the other older works, right? On on La Comedia? Not as much as you think. He's a bit... Really? Um, yeah, he's not on... He's, he's kind of a Luddite when it comes to email and stuff, so... <laughs> he only by way of his assistant, whom whom he sees like once or twice a week. Huh. Um. So it's been mostly actually through Boozy and Hawks. They've been you know through um, Boozy has been you know really helpful. Um. And I'm only saying that because Patrick's right there. So, <laughs> um. They've been you know. He's they, trying they, to he's trying to sweeten me up. Yeah. So no, no. It, it mostly through through Boozy. Um. Yeah. Louis is surprisingly not. Um, with this stuff, I mean, he, he'll answer your questions and whatnot, but it's not been an issue of... And, you know, the revisions in the parts have been mostly about formatting and things like that. It's, it's, right. There's not a lot of changes to the piece. Right. So it wasn't an issue of, you know, is this changed? You know, what's, what's going on here? It's more of, you know, it was just formats and things like that. And yeah. then figure, okay, how much of the electronics do we need? And, you know, what's the deal with, with you know, the speech here? And um, are you sure you don't want me to conduct this jazz section? Um, things like that. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, uh. so I guess that means that we're probably not going to get Louie on the show, Sam. Sam was saying before the show that we should get, get Louie on, <laughs> on, on Skype with us one of these days. We'll, we'll, we'll read a letter that he writes to us on, on the show. Right. There you go. I'll play you the phone mail message that he sent me for you. <laughs> there we That's go. It's never getting deleted. <laughs> 
Um, well, th thanks for thanks for sharing all that info about Andreessen Seventy Five. I mean, I think that's going to be a really great festival, and I can't wait to see it. And if you're yeah. in the area, you should check it out. Yeah, definitely. Go to Andreessen Seventy Five dot com for more info. And so, Great Noise is very busy with this festival coming up. But you guys released an album just last December, correct? Yep. Here it is, Gorilla New Music. Boom. Um, brand I new like the album. art. But yeah, yeah. This is, Katie Keller did the art. She's our clarinetist and managing director, and she's an amazing graphic designer. And um, let me just put it up. Oh, there it goes. The better graphic. So she nice. did the, I'm still the, on the ball. Design on it. Um, yeah. <laughs> So it came out last December. It's got music by Rob Patterson, DJ Spar, Mark Mellet, and myself. Um, awesome. Now yeah. I did. I did hear. I did hear Rob's piece at the Demena Center. Um, yeah. A little while ago. I don't. I forget if anything else from the from the album was on there though, uh, on the program. No, because that was his own group. Uh, oh yes, yes, yes. So, um, but it is such a cool piece of music. I I really like it. Yeah, it's a really, really hard piece of music too. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Based I called on... How what's it like conducting it now? Doesn't it suck to like conduct that first page? Isn't that hard? <laughs> yeah, man, it's hard. I know. Like now you know how I feel. Um, <laughs> uh, but no, it's it's it's, it's all, based on Looney Tunes characters. Yeah. So it's, it's, yeah, all, it's... called Looney Tunes. It's all and I think it, it, it's amazing. I would like to hear like somehow do a study where play it for twenty-one year olds. And then play it for forty-one-year-olds, and I think it's going to be a totally well. I don't know because those cartoons have been around and are still watched, but probably not so much as they were when I was a kid. Right. So, in other words, the, it's sort of riffing on uh, content that I know really, really well in that right. piece. And well, so, my experience listening would be a little different than someone who hadn't had that. I mean, it still sounds interesting, but it wouldn't have the same effect. Right. Well, we when we did the premiere. Um, I forget when that was. I guess it must have been. I think it was the spring of 2010. So my oldest daughter was eight. She was at the concert, and she's she's not grown up with Looney Tunes, but she was asking, "Oh, Taz, there's the first movement is Taz, Tasmanian Devil." She's like, "Taz must be really crazy and energetic." It's like so, and she had never seen. It. It's like, "Oh yeah, well, we, let me show you." Um, and you know, it was it's it's to Rob's great credit as a composer that he was able to convey the character of these characters to a point where. A kid who hadn't seen Looney Tunes cartoons yet could tell what you know what the characters were like. Yeah, Definitely. yeah, that's fantastic. Oh. And did, did you? I wonder if if so. Popular culture references in music, I think, are always really interesting because of that. Um, you know, shelf life isn't the right word because it means it makes it seem like the music's going to expire, but it's definitely of a specific time in a way that something like you know we talked about the abstractness of music for 18 musicians is always gonna like that's not gonna mean anything different necessarily to somebody at least the 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 kind of title idea isn't gonna mean anything different to anybody in in 50 years but it if if taz is such a specific thing for people our age like i'm not even sure that my my parents would know that much about who the Tasmanian devil was. And so there's like this little parenthesis of people that know that cultural reference. Mm. Um, but outside that, and as that parenthesis, you know, gets older and we all die, what, what does that, that music mean? Or, or even as, is as other people hear it, right. As that parenthesis becomes a, a smaller group of the audience, what does that mean to, to the music? Right. I don't know. Mm, well, I mean, I think it's, I don't think it's anything different than like, you know, Massene writing the sorrows, you know, writing Werther based on the Goethe novel, The Sorrows of the Young Werther, which was, a, you know, you didn't, con you know, they, the 19th century didn't consider this popular culture, but it was, you know, the equivalent of that is a very popular novel in the, in the late 18th century. Um, I, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I, you know what? I mean, I, I think I don't worry about it. I think mm -hmm. you know, music. I'm interested in writing music that's its, of its time and of its culture, and I think that you know we're gonna we lose some references ultimately. Um, 
we've lost a lot of semiotic code from the 19th century because in, in the 20th century we thought that t talking about um, extra musical things was not appropriate mm -hmm. in in the the theoretical aesthetic discourse because it was too subjective. But what we've rediscu been rediscovering over the last 20, 25 years through, through applying semiotic um, techniques to music theory is that, you know what, it wasn't always subjective. There were certain codes that were expected in different eras and um, that represented specific emotions and specific ideas in a musical context. I think the same thing is happening here. Um, and, you know, some of this, yeah, we'll have to, part of the role for future musicians will be to research and, and educate. Um, just like, you know, when we look at Debussy's um, Minstrels in the Prelude Book One or Golly Walk's Cakewalk, we have to talk about actually really uncomfortable things from, from popular culture at the turn of the 20th century. And, but also talk about what, when the world was a, a, a a cakewalk and you know what you know these dances that aren't as you know, that, that are historical artifacts now that were popular culture at the time um so i think i mean it's just that's just part of culture that's yeah part of i wonder i wonder what that there's going to be there's going to be some musicology class in in 80 years that is like watching looney tunes and yeah, right? as as part of their <laughs> research into the tasmanian devil right that mm -hmm. the, i find that to be a delightful image <laughs> I'm gonna be watching things on YouTube. Yeah. Well, um, what, no. Go ahead, Sam. Well, to me, of course, writing a piece that embraces some embedded pop or you know cultural element this strongly makes it different a little bit from calling something like a three movement piece a chamber symphony, you know, as an example. Um, but to me, this is one of the greatest things that music can do now. It doesn't have to, but it can embrace the world that it lives in because there's so much shared knowledge and you can count on that cultural uh, reference or those cultural references being having a, a wide set, you know, a, a wide population is going to know that. Um, so avoiding it because of shelf life concerns, Dave, I don't think is is the way to go. No, I think I, that, I, I don't think it's bad. I was just pointing I, it I out. know. I think it, uh, it 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 lets go of the idea that as a composer with a capital C, it's still your job to try to get your piece into the canon. You know. Right. No, and I think that's the real the real thing to 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 think about is is if that is even the goal. Like if 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 having this music heard in eighty years is really the point of writing it, I would say that no. it's not. Um, but it, it's certainly a distinction. Maybe and maybe maybe like Armando's pointing out that it's not really something that I should be distinguishing because there are certainly all these other cultural references from the last hundred, two hundred, four hundred years of the music that that I've listened to um, that I just either did look into and find out about or decided that I didn't care and the music was fine or not fine on its own without those things. Well, I would say that's synonymous with like writing pieces that are based on uh, Greek mythology, as an example. You assume that people are going to have a frame of reference, but over time, the, the degree to which you can count on people having that frame of reference has diminished. But there's lots of pieces that were written that way that are still considered great pieces. You know, I think Tasmanian Devil and Froghorn Leghorn and all those guys are part of the pantheon of, <laughs> you know, they've been canonized in our in our cultural lexicon. So well, and Froghorn Leghorn is is removed enough that we don't. I I think isn't Froghorn Leghorn based on a real like senator or something so. like that? Uh, like there's a guy so. that is the is the inspiration for Froghorn Leghorn, and I. Yeah. I kind of vaguely know that that is the case, but I can't imagine that most people that know Foghorn Leghorn know or care about who that person yeah. is. I don't really care who that person is. I like um, the voice. That's, but that's, imagine you're characterized, you're talking about characterizing a piece, and you say, the fourth movement is about Roadrunner. If you know who Roadrunner is, you start to form a picture in your mind, not dissimilar than somebody might have said in years past. The fourth movement is about uh, Loki, you know, and he's a mischievous and god and blah, 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 whatever, you know. To me, that's yeah. the same thing. You say thing. Loki, and I think of Tom Hiddleston, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> true. Movies ruin everything. 
Well, I mean, those cultural references are interesting, and they, they can work the other way too. We saw, we read in the news this week that um, Mozart in the Jungle, the uh, the Amazon original series, got got picked up for. Well, it's now going to be an Amazon original series. Uh, right. We talked about the pilot a few weeks ago of a, a drama comedy thing, half hour show that is is going to air on air on Amazon for Amazon Prime Instant Streaming, and it's about the behind the scenes culture of a classical symphony orchestra. Um, and I can't imagine that most people that they hope to watch this thing are going to be terribly familiar with the inner workings of a symphony orchestra. And I don't ter- think that that really uh, is something that they care about because, you know, th- just like that piece about the Roadrunner can make sense, even if you've never seen the Roadrunner or Wile E. Coyote in your life, this show about, um, you know, a conductor and an oboist can make sense even if you've never met a conductor or an oboist. Well, I think that was the appeal of the book in the first place because absolutely the the, the idea of the book was like, oh, you don't know about what happens you know, behind the <laughs> scenes. Let me show you. Well, yeah. and, and you assume that it's people wearing tuxedos all the time. Yeah. Well, Megan, my wife, Megan, has, still hasn't seen the, the pilot, and but I told her on the way to work, I think yesterday, Mozart of the Jungle got picked up. They're going to make the series. And, and she said, oh, yeah, what is that about? And I said, it's set, at, you know, I gave her the premise with the oboist and the new conductor. And I said, and it's like, you know, sex and drugs and people, you know, all that kind of stuff that musicians do. And then they're also going around playing gigs. And she said, and then we both simultaneously said, like real classical musicians. <laughs> like, yes, like real <laughs> classical musicians. Sex and drugs and backstabbing and egos and all that stuff. But we are all very nice here on Sound Notion, and <laughs> all, right. as are all of the colleagues that we have ever had in our careers. Ever. That's right. Ever. Right? Yeah. I mean, I, it sounds like it. it. Sounds like you hit the nail on the head. Do you guys have any interest in watching this series? I'm totally going to watch it. I, I, would like, I would like to watch it. Um, watch it. But uh, have you seen the pilot? Um, I don't have. I don't know. I I seen like a like a few clips from the pilot. I haven't watched it yet. I'll, I'll have to watch the first episode then, then see if I'm gonna buy Amazon Prime. We should say they just upped the price of Amazon Prime this week as well. The same week. Da, da, da. I and I don't think these are related, but you know, uh, the they just they changed this new up hot the price. Ticket item. <laughs> I know this new hot ticket classical music television show, um, <laughs> that's not on television, uh went from 80 bucks a year up to 100 bucks a year um so i mean it's i still think it's a good deal i i'm still gonna do it at 100 bucks a year but you know whatever cheaper than netflix i actually it's it's i think maybe even more than netflix now it's like a couple cents more oh uh, yes Uh, oh really but you also get free two-day shipping on all the other stuff and there's a rumor that they're going to launch a streaming music service that's going to be a part of it as well so (laughs) Oh. Another streaming music service. Because that's what the world needs, guys. Yeah. Yet another streaming music yeah. service. Just, just like Burt Bacharach saying. Yeah. Well, what? Never mind. What the world needs now. Oh, what the world needs now. Got it's it. Streaming. Sorry, I didn't it's make that. I didn't make that connection. I'm not. All right. All right. Clearly, Let's need more it. coffee. You know what musicians really need? What? Oftentimes, and it's really in short supply, is parking but. to get their crap from their car into wherever they're playing. Um, I mean, we've all been in this situation, whether it's, you know, hauling in to play a rock gig or trying to find how to get into the big concert hall with your clarinet or whatever. Um, But several clubs in Seattle have sort of banded together and uh, put up all basically all they're doing is putting a sign in their loading zone that says priority musicians loading and unloading. So it's only as enforceable as your average loading zone sign. But it's interesting that they've gone out of their way to um, target musicians. Well, um, I'll tell you what. I never park in loading zones, so it's going to work for me. Well, to me, this is like uh, you know, loading um, par- musicians park in loading zones already usually, and they just expect to get a ticket. Isn't that the way that works? I guess so. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. it's 15 bucks. Yeah. Like, Patrick, don't you live in New York? I mean, you don't need a car. Yeah, you don't drive, right? I- I yeah, used to you drive, drive all right? The there was a time too. in my life. I used to live when in Tallahassee. Time, when was the last time you piloted an automobile, automobile Patrick? Piloted? Uh, whenever I go up to visit my family in Massachusetts. Ah, okay. And then I can, then I can put the windows down and smell the pine. Right. right. 
because you're in you're in real America I mean, that's, at that point. That's, that's America. Right. Actually, that's not America. That's no. I, I guess Mer- re- real America. That you're still much too close to the ocean for <laughs> that to be real too, America. Those right. states are way too blue for real America. <laughs> Well, in, uh, back to the Seattle thing. Um, Se- Seattle, as we know, has a pretty lively music scene, which I think is why this became an issue to begin with. There's lots of bands and there's lots of places for bands of lots of different uh, experience levels, let's say, to play gigs. It'll be interesting to see because the mu- the clubs that are already doing it are trying to get other clubs to do it. So it'll be interesting to see if market forces uh, – encourage other clubs to make priority musician parking also as a way to to get the acts they want we'll see i like the idea i like it yes yeah and last oh my goodness whoa whoa what sound i did somebody just get an im from 1997 <laughs> i just i think some magic just happened <laughs> yes that might be. Is that me? No, that's me. I'm just kidding. I'm just playing. <laughs> We're running a gag. Here. We're running a gag. Sorry. Oh, oh, oh. Um, this uh, this is AOL a new a new site. Right that, say what? I was I was on AIM right oh, now. Oh right. <laughs> I, I mean I I actually I, I, I actually do use AIM is one of the ways my students oh, really? contact me, uh, but it doesn't sound like that anymore. Uh, in fact, I don't know if it even is a thing anymore. I I just use the the protocol. I don't actually use their their application. But that sound is one of the sounds that um, was, I think, emblematic of internet culture for a long time. And there is a group of of people who are trying to under this. They've they've made a name. Brendan Chilcut, which is seems to be the 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 work of actually three people that have taken on the name Brendan Chilcut as a, a nom de plume, but uh, they have put together a, an online museum of sorts that they intend to grow. This of, is, it's, it's a musicology archive. Sure, if you <laughs> absolutely must. I must. Uh, of of sounds that they are concerned we're going to lose. These are this is the Museum of Endangered Sounds, uh, and you can visit it on uh, on the web at savethesounds.info. And there are all these great sounds that uh, like the the AOL sound that um, they're concerned that we might be losing forever. That it we're so closely tied to, you know, what. Uh, what what the the world around us sounded like um because they're made by devices exclusively by devices that don't exist anymore like this Nokia ringtone yes like we're never people aren't going to going to hear those sounds and that's going to have been such an important you know sound of what the world sound the sound that the world made for so long um Anyway, I think I think it's a very interesting project. I'm curious as to what the 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 licensing concerns are for these sounds, uh, <laughs> not only for them posting them, but for me stealing them and using them in things. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's a rotary phone sound. Wow. And a tape deck. Not bad. So this is a very cool site. It's very simple right now. It's only got about I don't know. 20, 15 or 20 sounds. Um, but uh, based on the, the, the Wired article that we read about it, it seems like it's going to grow. And uh, I've bookmarked it. What do you think? Yes. I think, I think some sort of uh, remix project is in store as they accumulate more and more sounds. I'm, I'm sure that's their goal. Yeah. Some sort of a commissioning project where you have to use all noises from the site. All right. Yes. I can dig it. I like it. You know, one thing I didn't find on there um, is a uh, a dial-up modem connecting noise. Oh no, it's on there. It's on there. Oh really? I, yeah, well, they like... just got pictures. Oh, there it is. Is it the AOL? There it is. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Play that one for us, Dave. Uh, that one is probably the most iconic to me because it, it has the, it has the sound of impending wonder. I'm getting on the internet. Uh, 
Ah, <laughs> uh, that's that's the drop right yeah. there. Yeah. That's it. That's when um, you know the, the, you're you're see, home. I, I, I wonder. I, the, the, I think so, stuff like this. I didn't there know if I was a... going to get. I don't know if I was going to get connected at 28k, 36k, or 52k at that point. <laughs> or 300 baud. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I I I hope that there is a way for people to submit their own things because otherwise these people have to track down all this stuff, right? Yeah. Um, I I would love some kind of user submitted version of this though that again creates this problem anytime you've got users uploading their own stuff you've got licensing issues so i i would i have no idea how that's going to work but armando have you ever used any 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 sounds like these in in pieces or um no you know electronics electronics have never been something i use very very much so no i never i never have Mm. um Mm. it's just not an aesthetic direction i've ever been attracted to i'm sorry do, do you think about the the what do you what do you think of the idea of trying to hang on to these sounds that we would otherwise lose as they're made exclusively by these devices that people simply don't use anymore i don't know i i kind of don't miss that dial-up modem sound <laughs> <laughs> one of the ugliest sounds in the universe um it just makes me think of a seinfeld episode and that, this kind of dates me now but you know making a seinfeld reference but you know Elaine getting all these faxes to her phone number, um, but you know we're not we're not uh, cataloging. Nobody cataloged the sounds of horse hooves on on cobblestone streets and things like that. I don't know. It, it, Only because they couldn't. Well, okay, yeah, good point. I mean, I we, have, you, we have we have near we, infinite storage. We can we can do whatever we want with with all this this great storage. Why not and, and you, save everything and then we'll solve that. Give you a terabyte for ten bucks a month. That's okay? right. And for horses, we have British people with coconuts. That's right. <laughs> there you go. That is true. That is true. I think we should uh, we should uh, talk about Armando's piece on this. We on should. This Let's do that. Okay. How, to, how to make something that sounds really cool even without electronics. <laughs> So what do we have, uh, Patrick? I'll let you uh, introduce this. Um, yeah, well, this is uh, on the on the new album is uh, Armando Pajolo's Chamber Symphony. Um, and the what name is of the album is Gorilla, uh, Gorilla New Music. Gorilla New Music, which we talked about a little bit ago. And uh, what is the subtitle for this, Armando? The piece is called Chamber Symphony: Illusory Airs. Um, the illusory airs comes from the piece was. The piece has a tune that was the catalyst for everything in the, all of the material in the entire piece, but the tune itself is never heard, at least not in, in its entirety. Um, it's very sneaky of you. It, well, it just sort of happened. <laughs> it was written kind of backwards with the third movement first and, you know, then the second movement. And the, I thought, well, this will be the main theme of the first movement. But then the first movement ended up being completely different and not really having themes so much of being being more about pulse and tempo. And um, so um, just had, it was, yeah, so it just ended up not being, um, not making it into the piece itself. What ended up happening, though, is that that made me think about connectivity and all the things we were just talking about and the Internet and how we're, so theoretically, so easily connected across you know countries and time zones and whatnot, but we're not ironically at the same time kind of retreating into private, isolated spaces. Um, so that that idea of the the score of the t- the tune um, being part of every bit of genetics of that piece, but not actually being heard, kind of spoke to me in this idea of isolation through connectivity. Um, so the piece is ostensibly a little bit about that as well. So when you say isolation, you mean physical isolation? Physical, physical isolation, yeah. Okay, interesting. So uh, we're going to listen to an excerpt from this, which w- 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 we said we were going to listen to the, th- the third movement. A third is that all right? No, 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 that's fine. I just want to make sure that I'm going to do the thing that we had talked about doing before and not like yeah. change the script at the last minute because I'm not paying attention. Um, so this is this is the third movement of Armando's Chamber Symphony Illusory Airs, uh, performed by the Great Noise Ensemble. Or you, you guys probably don't say the Great Noise Ensemble. Yeah, it sounded like a dummy, it's right? Ensemble. It's gr- performed by Great Noise Ensemble on their new album, Gorilla New Music. Thank you. 
That was an excerpt performed by Great Noise Ensemble of our guest Armando Bajolo's Chamber Symphony Illusory Airs through movement. Check it out. Uh, you can you can get this. This is available everywhere, right? You can even you can even stream it on Spotify. You can buy it on Amazon or iTunes or wherever. Uh, Armando, thank you for sharing that with us. Oh, thank you for sharing it with everybody. You should. You, everybody should, should check it out. I don't want to. I don't. I don't. I don't want to spoil the ending, but it's pretty <laughs> awesome. Everybody should check it out and buy multiple copies. And, right, and um, buy it for your friends. So, you know, you never know who's going to need a copy. Just give it away to strangers on the street. Right, um, and you can never have too many spares. All, all, all proceeds benefit indig- the indigent musicians of Great Noise Ensemble. <laughs> Right, a worthy charity. Use right. the money. Right, um, I I think that's gonna do it for us this morning. It's very fun to talk to you as always, Armando. Thank you so much for your time this morning. <laughs> Be back. Um, one one quick thing, Dave. Yeah. Uh, last week we talked about uh, Robert Ashley passing away. Yes. Uh, we're not gonna talk about it on the show, but there's a really long and and interesting piece on New Music Box right now about Robert Ashley. Mm-hmm called a tribute to robert ashley you know that's one thing that i really value about the about that site is when (laughs) when somebody of of his stature passes or even somebody that's not as as significant there there are all these like you know instant obits that come from new york times arts and 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 places like that and then like a week later there's a really thoughtful piece about the impact of a whole career on New mm-hmm. Music Box, and I, 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 I really value that about them. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, definitely check that out. It's a great piece. Yeah, if I wanted to summarize the Wikipedia article, I'd do it myself. <laughs> right. Um, before we go real quick, uh, any, any last uh, plugs, Armando, that you want to give? Where, where can people go to find out more about Great Noise Ensemble and Andreessen 75? All right, right. So Great Noise Ensemble, we're always at greatnoiseensemble.com. Um, you, you can also hear us on SoundCloud, and you can download the CD on CD Baby, Spotify. Uh, well, you can't download it on Spotify, but iTunes and Amazon, and where in Sam Goody's. Wait, um, <laughs> I wish your local and, Tower Records. <laughs> tower. Oh, <laughs> and uh, I still get you know whenever I go to Lincoln Center, I still like look over there and like there shouldn't be a cafe. That's Tower, um, and. My own website, ArmandoBajolo.com, and you can find me also on SoundCloud, and, and Andreessen75 is at Andreessen75.com. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, we really appreciate your time, uh, and we're happy to, anytime you got something big coming on, just drop us a line, you want to plug it on the show, we're happy to, to have you right. back to talk about it, because it's, it's it. fun talking uh, every time. Um we do this show live nearly every Sunday at 11 a.m. We're actually going to take next week off. I'm going to be out of town, and as digital and cloud-based and magical electronic internet thing as this project is, it does require that I physically be in, in proximity to this gear. Uh, so we're not going to do a live show next week. Those of you that listen to the show as a podcast, fear not. There will be content for you. Uh, we're going to put together some... Great clips of some of our other shows at Sound Ocean TV. We do other shows. Oh, my goodness. If you only listen to this show, you might be interested in some of our other shows. Uh, we have a great show, Streamers and Punches, uh, about film music. Another great show, Patch In, about electronic music. And a relatively uh, new, at least to us, show called All the Cool Parts, uh, which is an audio show that we just helped to, to relaunch at the beginning of this year by Anthony Landman, and he's working on something great for this month, and I don't want to spoil it, but you should check it out when it comes out. It's a one-on-one interview show. And it's a, it's a great one-on-one interview show. He does all kinds of things. Um, but the last episode, which and we'll have a clip of this actually in, in, the next, uh, in this, this show that we're going to put out next week, of an interview he did with Brad Wells, founder of uh, Roomful of Teeth, that we've been speaking out a lot about a lot over the last year, the vocal chamber ensemble that uh, premiered the last year's Pulitzer Prize winner, Carolyn Shaw's Partita for Eight Voices, and won a Grammy and and is is, is kicking all kinds of ass. And, and right after they were at Atlas, mind you. So oh, not so they got the Atlas bump. This, but yeah. <laughs> oh. and Louis won the Grammeier for Comedia right after he worked with me. So uh, the by, the Bajolo bump. Yeah, I'm the not Bajolo a bump. Kingmaker, but I'm a kingmaker. 
So uh, I, I, I think I that's reasonable. I, we're going to add that to your oh, next time God. you're on the show. Your lower that third is going to say Kingmaker <laughs> Armando Bajola. I just said that live on the air. Oh my God. <laughs> well, I oh. guess other people are going to have to want to work with you now. My publicist is going to. I don't have a publicist, but I'm, oh my gosh, that's gonna. You should bite. pretend you have a publicist. That's, my publicist, my PR people are going to. Yeah. No, I'm like Bill Murray. I have a. I have an eight hundred number. Right. That yeah. Makes sense. That is actually really cool. He doesn't have a publicist at all. Bill Murray has an eight hundred number where you can call and pitch your movie idea to him right. on an answering service. Yeah, isn't that great? That's yeah, I gotta. <laughs> gotta do that. That's wonderful. So. You should tune into those things, and we will have them for you uh, in, a, in, a, in a nice, tidy package that you can download next week, even though we won't be live. But we will be back live the week after that uh, at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. You can join us at soundnotion.tv slash live in chat to, to participate in our conversation. We love when people do that. You can subscribe to this show and all our shows in the iTunes podcast section or wherever finer podcasts are aggregated. Uh, if you'd like to support the show, tell your friends. Use our Amazon affiliate link on the site. Uh, we get a tiny little commission if you buy things after searching them on the little thing on our site. It doesn't cost you anything different, but it helps us out a lot. Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo. Thank you, Patrick, for doing that. He performed it live, actually. And uh, was like, video by Tyler Lapp. It yes. was all mouth noises. Right, all <laughs> mouth noises. So thank you so much for watching or listening, or I don't know if there's any other way to consume the show, but if you're watching or listening, thank you so much, and we will uh, we'll have a, a, a recorded show for you next week, and we'll see you back live in two weeks. Bajolo bump. That's nice. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.